It all began in 1972 with a bunch of Silicon Valley rebels who quit their boring 9 to 5 engineering jobs to pursue a computer games dream. <laughs> A hó bélaim, vajon hányan vannak közületeknek a gyűrűkről, nem a legény élet keserű feladása, a Tolkien regénye, vagy éppen a Feri gyűrűs memory eszébe, hanem egy kék egifüggő sünnmalac, aki szajdében robotokat zúz és flipper golyónak hiszi magát. A Sega konzoljai viszonylag a háttérben mozogtak, a kisé játékűrhajó hangulatú SG-1000 család szinte csak Japánban, Ausztráliában, Olaszországban és Spanyolországban jelent meg, mely rengeteg változatban és külcsinnyel volt elérhető, köztük volt az SC-3000 számítógép is, mely a Famicom kihívójának kiérkezett. Hamarosan a már ismertebb, de hardware elemeiben rendkívül hasonlatos és visszafele kompatibilis Sega Master System váltotta, mely már 8 kB RAM-mal és 16 kB virtuális RAM-mal bírt. Két érdekesség tűnt fel a Sega gépei kapcsán, az egyik, hogy mennyire végkísérte őket a Texas Instrument SN76489 hangcsipje, gyakorlatilag még a Sega Genesis-ben is ott volt a VDP-ben a hangeffektek képzőjeként. Pedig a sokkal, de sokkal öregebb Texas Instruments T99 számítógépekben is ott volt már, a másik pedig, hogy milyen sok ramot használtak relatíve a Nintendo párhuzamosan gyártott gépeihez képest. A Master System szintén nem tudta a Nintendo-t megszorongatni, de a Sega legsikeresebb kézi konzoljának a Game Gear-nek az alapjául szolgálhatott. A Sega igazi aranykorát a Sega Genesis hozta el, mert időben az SNES előtt kínált lehetőséget a 16 es játékélményre, kirobbantva a Sega és Nintendo között fennálló bit háborúkat. Érdekes módon elméletben papíron a Sega Master Systemet Brazíliában mind a mai napig gyártják, gondolom valaki elfelejtette hivatalosan lezárni, a Sega genesis pedig a változatlan újrakiadásáról szólnak a hírek, de most nem ezért vagyunk itt. Sega Genesis már egy méltó golyó szorongatója volt a Nintendo egyeduralmának, ebben viszont komoly szerepet játszott, hogy a Sega is kitalált valakit, akit a játékosok megszerethetnek. Miután a hamburger zabáló Alex Kidd hiány volt karizmatikusságnak, a Sega pályázat írt ki az új kabal megalkotására, melynek eredményeként 1991-ben megszületett Sonic. Ez a pályázat eredményezte Ristar elődjének megjelenését is, aki sajnos egy méltatlanul elfeledett videójáték karakter maradt, de pontosan ezen a pályázaton született meg az örökös főgonosz Dr. Robotnik elődje is, akit már egyrendnek ki. A Sonic játékok némileg egyszerű koncepciót követtek, mint a rivális Mario játékok, a Shungal már központi eleme volt az akkori szemnek hihetetlen sebesség és a gyűrűgyűjtögetés az amúgy egy találatos halál miatt. A Sonic játékok rengeteg játszó karakterrel bővültek, az univerzum egyre nagyobbá vált, rajzfilmek készültek fiatalabbak és idősebbek szórakoztatására. Sajnos a következő konzol a Sega Saturn gyengeségei, a Sega Nomad kvázi ismeretlensége, illetve a Dreamcast alulmaradása a Playstation 2 multimédiás képességeivel szemben beárnyékolták a Sonic játékokat is. Próbálták lemásolni a Mario Kartot és a Mario Party sikert, illetve volt, hogy csak simán félre sikerült valami. Ma pedig az a furcsa helyzet állt elő, hogy a két korábbi rivális kibékült, így Mario x Sonic crossover játék is létezik, de a Sega tulajdonképpen ma már minden konzolra fejlett és kizállag a szoftver elemekkel foglalkozik, miközben... Egy pillanat! Eltévesztettem volna a YouTube csatornát! Nem, nem bolondultam meg, ugyanis sok egyéb mellett jelent meg Sonic játék az Atari 2600-ra. 2014-ben. Nem könnyű információkat találni róla, de Chris Pry 2013-ban kezdte el publikálni demóként Batari Basic-ben írt játékprogramját az Atari Agent, és a megfelelő topikban gyakorta végigkövethetjük a fejlesztés menetét, az elég kerülő problémák sorozatát, ahogy a öteteket cserélt a tagokkal, és kvázi ezt teszi ezt az egész Hamburg dolgot csodálatossá a retro életérzés által összekovásolt kreatív chip közösség. 
Amit én ezekből a sorokból leszűrtem, hogy a TIA rendkívül korlátozott hangkészleten nagyon kifogott a programozón, hogy 64 kilobajtos romot használt a rengeteg sprite és egyéb játékelem tárolására, valamint hogy 5 kristályt kell robotintól visszaszereznünk, és az ő magatartásától függ, hogy a térkép mely elemeit kell bejártunk. A boxart nagyon tetszik, ugye a cím módosítva lett, ahogyan az Atari 2600 Mario és Princess Rescue, de az art azonnal felismerhető, nekem nagyon tetszik ez a rajzfilmszerű grafika, ami visszaköszön. De foglalkozzunk a já... Biztosan csak ide fújta a szél. Én magam csak a Sonic the Hedgehog Hong Kong által Femiclonra átorzított torzó vázalat ismertem, belasítva a gagyi grafikával, ezért a vad nosztalgia biztos nem vakít el. No igen, láthatjátok mennyire másként viselkednek a PA gépek, 60 hercet kapnak. A cartridge hátulján is ott van, hogy PA 60, szóval az NTSC mellett Chris Prime nem az európai PA vázat készítette el, hanem a Brazíliában használt PA M formátumot, ami nagyon sok paraméterben az NTSC-nek felel meg. A dolog nem lett meg, hogy az Atari 2600-on a programozónak magának kell a scanline számához igazítania a grafikát. Ugyanis a Palen formátum esetében 60 Hz képfrissítés mellett 525 scanline volt használatos, míg az európai Pál esetében 50 Hz frissítés mellett 625. És ezt Atari 2006 esetében így nem lehet csak úgy simán elnyújtani. Érdekes mód az ősrégi Videoton TV gond nélkül megbirkózik vele, de az LG DVD felvőn meg kifog és elcsúszik a kép. A kezdőképerő nagyon bejön egyszerű, de Sonic úgy mosog, mint aki életében először lát melleket, a kultikus zene pedig olyan édesi átorzítva. A térképen láthatjuk, ahogyan begyűjti Dr. Robotnél a kristályokat, amiket ki kellene vernünk belőle. Véletlenszerű, hogy melyik világban kezdünk, ami annyiban kellemetlen, hogy lehetetlen begyakorolni az első szinteket. A játék grafikája páratlan, eléggé hasonlít a Princess Rescue-ra ebből a szempontból is, a fő és a képernyőz mérten nagy és részletesen kidolgozott, még a topogó mozgás is adott. Az ellenfelek többséget szintén felismert az eredeti játékból. A pálya viszont... Szóval egy igazságtalan tahó lennék, mint régen! Hey! Mennyi Atari játékban volt szépen megrajzolt statikus háttér erre a Mario és Sonic átiratban meg egyszínű vagy hogy sima téglalapokból áll a pálya, mint mondjuk a Pitfallban kidolgozottak a tereptárgyak is? Nos, én úgy gondolom, hogy mivel sem a hercegnő mentés, sem a sünkalan nem tartalmaz tükrözött hátteret valamit ezekben a játékban, rengeteg fizikát kell programozni, teszem azt például az ugrást, ami emlékszem rá, hogy nekem Game körben is hatalmas kihívás volt, én úgy gondolom, hogy grafikkal némileg fel lett áldozva ennek az oltárán a CPU használat érdekében. Azért programozási hibák előfordulnak, ami a képernyőn kívül van mindig rejté, objektumok tűnnek el, illetve kerülnek oda random, az ugrás még néha csúnyan irreszponzív, ami az eredeti játék gyors pattogós játékmenetét nagyon megnehezíti, pedig bizony igény az volna rá a széles szakadékoknál. Ilyenkor büntet nélkül dolgba egy Sega Jens irányított, díped nélkül meg se próbáljátok. A játéktér három szintű, a legalsó fekete hátterű kezdünk, a ruhok csak a fejjel jutásban kapnak szerepet, a második szint kék hátterű, a harmadik szint pedig egy breakout-szerű bónuszpálya. Az eredeti játékot nyilván nem lehetett visszadni, de ettől még állatira pumpálja az adrenalin. Érdekes módon vízatti rész szintén fekete, csak a belasult mozgásból és a falakból jöttem rá, hogy úszunk, szerencsére megfulladni nem tudunk. A játékot próbáltam szakmai szemmel is nézni, a legérdekesebb, hogy szinte mindig hat darab gyűrű vár ránk egyszerre, amiket párosával szedtünk fel, illetve két ellenfél soha nem jelent meg egyszerre a képernyőn. Az ellen szintén megakad, ha valami hangefekt megszólal, de a legfurcsább, amikor a talaj nem eltűnik, hanem a lábunk előtt megjelenik a barlang zónában, ott konkrétan belassul az egész játék, Nyilván valami önmagába visszatérő ciklus gyilkolja a szegény MOSZ 6507 cpu De hogy a játék élményről magáról is beszéljek, nehéz, piszkosul nehéz. Van három élet és azok elfogynak már sűvít is a Game Over a képedve és ez nem a Secret Quest, itt tényleg előről kell kezdened, hogy legalábbis az egy kristályjal megelőző állapotról. Na akkor most mi legyen? 7 óra játék és káromkodás újból, mint a múltkor? Nos, ami történt velem, hogy másfél óra alatt rengeteg káromkodás és csapkodás mellett kiátszottam ezt a csodát, de az anyagot, amit a DVD felvő felvett, csak ő maga akarta olvasni, a handbrake által grabbelt MP is használhatatlan volt, a menkoder sem tudott kezdeni vele semmit. 
Nos úgy, 5-6 óra agyalás és felváltott várakozástár rájöttem, hogy csak úgy tudom használni ezt az anyagot, ha a B-fedbe beimportálom a DVD-n található VRO file-ból a hanganyagot, ezt kimentem, majd Vegas 9-be beimportálom a VRO, de leállítom a PIK készítés miatt még kiváltokozna, aztán kimentem ezt az egészet hang nélkül, és talán a vércsaladabban összeollózom. Nem értem, miért utál engem minden modern cucc ennyire lassan? Egy tokodák, hogy valami ősrégi kamerával és egy VHS felhővel állok neki dolgozni, azok talán még elfogadnak. Az ellenfelek javarészt felismerhetek az eredeti játékból, sőt egyes játékelemek is visszatérnek, mint a gomnyomással nyíló kapu, vagy a plafonból elógó láncsa, illetve a flipper videók, hogy a játék hozza az eredetit, csak kell az a fenn nagy képzelőerő, ami most arra sajnos, hogy kiveszett belőlünk. Nekem személy szerint a Green Hill Zone jön be a legjobban a rengeteg fordulóval, a hidakkal, a dombokkal. Na, erről beszélek, képzelőerő! A vizes labirintus pályában különösen tetszett, hogy itt jutottam első két robotnik színe elé. Még az eredeti játékban itt mindig elakadtam. Ahogy haladunk előre a játékban, egyre szabadabban lesz bejárható, ergo előfordulható minden pályán összekoszáljuk robotnyi pajszát. Sajnos nála könnyű elvérezni, ugyanis hat találatot bír ki, míg te egy találat után elveszed a gyűrűidet, és utána a következő találatnál kompetsz. Ez különösen az utolsó csatánál durva, ahol egyrészt Rolknyik rendre van neked legrosszabb hely jelenik meg, másrészt a lövedék is kiszámíthatatlanok, aztán Game Over esetén elbuksz egy kristályt, és verheted meg még egyszer hagyományos módon, többnyire reméltem, hogy a Star Zone vagy a Cave Zone felé veszi az irányt. Győzelem estén, ha még látunk az agyukban keletkezett bevérzésektől, kapunk egy aranyos gratuláció képet, és ezzel a játék lezárult. Vagy mégsem? Nyilvánvaló, hogy egy régi játéknál van lehetőséget utánézni a végjátszáson túl a technikai háttérnek, az inspirációnak, az elkészítés körülményének, a fitkoknak, még ez a lehetőség egy alig pár éves Hambrú játéknál nem áll fent, úgyhogy ki más hívhattam volna segítségül, mint magát az alkotót. Köszöntsétek Chris Pride a világ másik feléről! Hello, here's member from Atarian and my guest for this interview is Chris Pry, the creator of Zippy the Parcupine, uh, it's very hard to pronounce. <laughs> Say hello. Hello there, how's it going? Uh, my first question for you, why have you chosen Sonic well, for this uh, game? The previous game that I did, Princess Rescue, you, I talked to you a little while before this interview, and, um, and you just found out, you just found out yeah, that I yeah. did Princess Rescue too, you had no idea. And, it, it's very similar in many aspects, and uh, I was wondering why, because it has the same large sprites of the main characters, uh, the sprites of the other characters are very detailed as well for the VCS, uh, but um, uh, the surroundings are made uh, uh, with the ability of the play field of the that's, Yeah, that's correct, that's about I the think. only way you can do it uh, when, you're, when you've got uh, a world uh, that your character's running through, because all you have in uh, on the Atari to use, at least hardware-wise, is two sprites, a ball, two missiles, and then the playfield blocks, and that's all you've got to and use. And, 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 and the background color too, got, as well. Yes, but yes, that's and about you all have you've to got to use. So you have to you have to do with what you've got, and I did the best I possibly could with both of those games, uh, Princess Rescue and Zippy the Porcupine. I think uh, you had made uh, the best with it because it's a very well designed game, uh, except some kind oh, of uh, yeah. programming mm -hmm. errors that uh, maybe happens because uh, with, the, with the outside of the screen that uh, some things appear, some things disappear, that's the only errors I have found, uh, maybe because uh, it's be, uh, the WCS mm, have a lot me of about it. I mean, it's uh, games on that scale, especially for a, a, a system that that's that is that primitive. Um, it's really easy to have things mess up, and when it's when the games are that big of a scale and you got so much going on all the time, it's hard to test for everything. In fact, on a Zippy the Porcupine, I had probably about eight beta testers. And they beta tested this thing and reported back errors for about six months. And I fixed... There's quite a bit of errors they were reporting. And I fixed all the ones they told me about. You told me about one that happened to you uh, just the other day. 
I had never heard of this problem before. This has never happened to me. It's never happened to any of my beta testers, but it happened to you. The the one when I uh, get to some point yeah, and that's never happened disappeared, before. then uh, sound of beeping appeared, then there was somehow Robotnik, <laughs> and then I have no just... idea that happens because that's the boss battle. <laughs> that was a really <laughs> different routine that happens in a different and I was of memory, I was... and how it jumped there like that, I could not begin to tell you how that happened. It's, uh, it's 64k program. I was so a lot of stuff. Uh, before creating games for the game makers on Windows, and the, the game makers <laughs> very different, and it's very different, uh, and uh, it had a lot of errors as well that was very hard to figure out. So I can imagine how hard it is with the mm. uh, VCS. Uh, I I know you were using the Atari Basic, so you had not to know right. The, Assemb uh, yeah, assembly I, language of the of yeah, the most CPU. Um, I I feel most comfortable with uh, basic programming. I've been programming with basic in one form or another since I was about I would say nine years old. Um, so, uh, well, that era of computing, maybe. yeah, um, in the eighties. Um, I didn't know anybody who had a Commodore sixty four. I, I was yeah, doing I didn't it know as well. Had a Commodore sixty four, but we had a local Radio Shack. Um, and that's where I got my first computer. Uh, the huh. schools, which the school system, which is where I learned about that. Hey, I can make computer games with computers if I just learn how to program them. And that's why I learned basic programming in the first place because I wanted to make my own games. And we had the very first computer I ever interfaced with was called the TRS-80 Color Computer 2. And overseas, I believe it's called the Dragon. Um, yeah. Oh, the dragon. Yeah, it, it looks yeah. like a bit like the Commodore, and it has yeah, green yeah, the, and the, dark uh, green. nuclear it's very green dark green green, so it looks like black. The black text. Yes. Thirty-two uh, yes. text <laughs> columns. Yes. Toxic. And uh, that was my first experience with computers. And I, uh, some uh, uh, a fellow classmate of mine, we used a, a program called Logo on it, which is you can it's like a little turtle that you can make drawings with, and that's. Oh, no. Oh no, the Cummins logo. <laughs> I think every I computer in the 80s had that program. I have, I have studied it in uh, uh, after 2000, and I don't know why. Nobody know why it was part of the yeah, educational system right. uh, that wow. late <laughs> for mm -hmm. us, and uh, we have really not uh, known uh, learning uh, how to uh, create compu uh, programs for the computer, and uh, that would be more suitable because uh, uh, in Europe, in this country, uh, there are not so many programmers that uh, we would need. So, going back to the cart okay. going back to the cartridge, uh, you have used uh, uh, 64 yeah. kilobytes for RAM, and uh, is there any nope. extra chips in Believe it? Believe it or not, yeah. No, Sarah? No. Oh, no. So, you have only... On, you have only used the 128 uh, yep. bytes of RAM for this whole game. <laughs> oh my god, so yeah, no and Sarah, I could, uh, nothing. elaborate even more on this. Oh um, my god. The limitations, especially when you're using Batari Basic. Now, at that time, when I was first starting Zippy, 32K was the max I could use. Um, that was what was developed with it. And they're developing at that time as I was just starting with Zippy to make a, a 64K expansion with it. And uh, they were able to do that. And I jumped on that as soon as they were, uh, the developer for Batari was added that in. And the Atari 2600 could only access 4K of ROM at one time. And there's a method called bank switching to allow you access different 4K banks. In uh, right. right, so they if you think about Zippy, cheaper, that's 16 yeah. 4K banks, and um, so you're able to get up to about 64K without using any special, like extra hardware. Except there is one extra chip to be able to do the bank switching. There is that, but it uses a 64K ROM though for all the code. So that's all you had to do to make these cartridges, which just have that one chip to do the bank switching, and then the ROM, and that's it. So no Sara, no anything, no anything special, no DPC, you know, ARM chip that some games do have. Um, so um, I was limited to everything else that Atari gave me, which meant I could only add certain amount of sprites and colors and 
what I could do with the playfield and all that stuff, and only 128 bytes of memory. Now with Batari, with Batari, you don't even yeah, have that much yeah. because Batari uses a lot of that memory for its own functions. So it gives you 26 bytes to play with, and that's it. I had to make this game with 26 bytes. And it's not uh, even. Yeah, I have already I have already calculated that. It's not enough for storing a short receipt for a cookie. <laughs> That's how short it is and it must be enough for games. And maybe many uh, do know that uh, uh, the VCS were designed exactly. for games That's like games were at the time. or RC Battles so, and for uh, maybe 10 games. I think they, they were planning 10 games for yeah, three it was only years have and a short then lifespan, uh, right. switch to another console. And it died out only. Yeah, for in for the, the US, it died, and they finally stopped uh, supporting it in 1990. And um, I think overseas was a few years yeah. after that. So yeah, it had a long lifespan, more than far more than they ever expected. What, 13 years? So at least here in the US, anyway, it was 13 years. So I mean, you could find games that have copyright yeah, date of 1990. Yeah. Uh, on Europe, the last game for the VCS was. Uh, in 19 uh, to uh, called acid drop and uh, it's like a tetris with colors but it has a very very awful music oh. of furelis from beta one and it's just killing the atari your ears because <laughs> it's so yeah, the atari out of soundtrack tune the tia, the tia uh, television interface adapter or the stella chip as it was also known it um yes. it took care of all the video and the audio I use the and all the card, but it's inputs. very limited as well. Inputs, some of the inputs. So it did everything through that little chip, and it only had two two uh, sound channels, um, and that's it. So you only have two sound sound channels to play with. This is why when you play like my games like Princess Rescue or Zippy the Porcupine, whenever you jump or run into something or whatever and does a sound effect, it always cuts out part of the music. There's only two channels to play with. Yes, yes, I realized that. <laughs> but it just stops. It's like uh, the music in Dig Dug. <laughs> oh yeah, it does. You're that right, stops. Yeah. That's only playing when you are work going, and then it just stops. At and then you use the, your pump, and then that's all you hear. Is... Uh, do an alarm <laughs> yeah. Sound. yeah, yeah, I know. What you're yeah, saying. it's it's See, it's horror like. That, yeah, you know, one of the limitations right there. And what was the hardest part? What was the hardest part to program? Because Everything? I, I uh, see that the boss battles are epic for the Atari 2600, and uh, I have not played uh, Princess Rescue right. because it's You can play it on the emulator, but that's but, about uh, it. I have seen that the boss battle is uh, like uh, maybe in Super Mario 3. Uh, it, uh, it's Princess like, Rescue, it's like it, it was based off of the original Super Mario Brothers, however I did add a little bit of things here and there from like Super Mario 3. Like you notice there's the, the um, well you said you never played it, but there are thwomps. I added thwomps in there because I just wanted them in there for the uh, the underground levels. So um, I added thwomps. I even added baby thwomps. So those were something from Super Mario 3 that I decided to throw in there. Um, the boss battles, of course it's not Bowser, it's it's basically Bowser Jr. Um, I just called him yeah. BJ. Yeah, um, yes, and yes. so you just fight him four times. There's 16 levels, so at the end of every fourth level is the boss battle. So you get to fight him four times in that game. And yeah, that was a 32K game. Have you ever had any no, messages I, from Sega? No, I never have gotten any direct um, any communication from Nintendo or Sega. The, what, what happened with uh, Nintendo, and I know we discussed this already, but this is for the interview, so I'll talk about it here. What happened with uh, Nintendo with Princess Rescue yeah, yeah. was, Princess Rescue came, uh, when I first started working with uh, making Princess Rescue, I never had any intentions on selling it. I just wanted to make uh, Super Mario Brothers for the Atari 2600. I just wanted to see this game on that system, and um, I knew that Batari Basic existed and I decided to give it a shot and I didn't get motivated to do this until um, I saw a, uh, somebody did a Mega Man demo with Batari Basic. I don't know if you've ever seen that or not. Um, it's a, I have seen that demo. It's, yeah, yeah, it's that really demo. impressive yeah. I, and they said they made it with Batari Basic. I'm going, no way. So I looked into it as soon as I saw that video and I... It looks very great. It, um, 
what I really wanted to ask uh, from you is uh, what was the hardest Honestly? part of the program? Um, did you? Oh, by the way, did you yes. want me to? Um, All of it, but, could, but was you the... want me to finish the story with uh, Nintendo and the whole C and D thing? All right, okay, I'll finish okay. that and then I'll get to your next question there. But okay, I do, do want to kind of finish the story. So, okay. so um, I I saw people were like attempting. Super Mario Brothers, but not getting that far, and it wasn't all that good from what I was seeing. I was like, shoot, somebody needs to do this. So I thought, why not myself? I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so I made a test game. It was okay. And then after that, it's like, all right, I'm going to give, now I'm really going to try. And uh, slowly over time, I started figuring things out and was able to get it to scroll and got levels, got Mario to do the, what Mario does, and I got the enemies in there, and it was coming together really well. And then I put up um, the demo of the first level on Atari Gage, and people were impressed with it. I just put it up there just to show what I was doing, and people were really impressed, and um, it got the attention of the owner of Atari Age, Albert, um, and he um, came to me like right after he saw it and said, hey, are you planning on selling this? I would like to sell this on the site when you're done. And I said, oh, sure, why not? I mean, that'd be cool. So... I went into it just making a fan game and had no intention of selling it and Albert saw it and wanted to do it so I said all right and about six months later I finished it and he put it up he was selling it and it, it somehow flew by Nintendo at first um, Wired Magazine did a uh, an article on it they interviewed me we did a photo shoot and um, so there was that that still didn't get their attention somehow it wasn't until IGN, about three or four months in, did a video review of it. And about a week after that review, Nintendo went to Albert of Atari Age and said, uh, no, you can't do that. They put they gave him a, what's called a, a C&D or a cease and desist order. And he had to pull it from the store and was not able to sell it after that. So that's why there's only a limited amount of copies out there of that game. Um, and then... Um, as far as Zippy the Porcupine goes, I don't think Sega cares, if they even know about it at all. They're a lot more lenient with their intellectual properties than Nintendo is. Nintendo is very protective of their intellectual properties. And going back to the first question, uh, have, you ch have you chosen uh, Sonic and Mario because uh, they are very popular in gaming culture and uh, uh, if you are testing your programming skills with them, uh, people will not notice it better, or because you love uh, Sonic and Mario. <laughs> well, I've always been a fan of the Mario franchise, so that was part of my motivation too, because I felt like uh, for making a Princess Rescue, um, because I wanted to see a Mario game on the Atari Twenty. I always wanted to see a Mario Super Mario game on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Now there was Mario Brothers, of course on the Atari 2600, the regular one, and it wasn't, it wasn't yes, very well yes, done, yes. but it's I, there, I and then, um, but they ne when I was a kid, I thought they were going to make Super Mario Brothers for the Atari 2, but they never did, and I was so disappointed in that, I mean, the Atari was the, By, but they did Double oh, yeah. Dragon, <laughs> and it's not a bad game, but it's uh, hard to recognize the character. Oh, yeah. But... The whole game is in there. The Atari, so <laughs> or Kung Fu Master. They, I didn't think they could do it <laughs> yes, um, yes. at the time either, so there might have been that as well. Um, but I, um, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, why did I choose? Um, I, I always had a love for the Atari, and um, because it was the first thing that introduced me to video games. I had it growing up. I love playing video games, all that stuff. So for it's like a special place in my heart for the Atari. So that's why I wanted to make it for for it because I still have a special place for for it there. And I was I want to see what more modern games would look like on that system. So that was that's part of my motivation for doing that. Um, so I, yeah, I'm also a Mario fan, so that's part of the motivation for doing it. Um, Sonic. Um, I I'm not as strong of a fan. I I do like the early Sonic games. Those are fun, but that's about as far as I'll go. The, the main reason why I did Sonic with, or Zippy the Porcupine was I had d done Princess Rescue. People on Atari Age were talking about, what are you going to do next? Why don't you try Sonic? And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of oh, how it happened. I said, you know what? <laughs> I just might. And so I said, all right, well, I got, Prince I got a Super Mario game. Why can't I do a, a Sonic game too? So I 
just did it. And it was... it took me a lot longer. Because... yeah. Uh, the, the fr maybe the three, uh, three most popular mascot characters are Pac-Man, Mario, and Sonic. Maybe they were asking oh, Solid I'm Snake not doing a Metal you. Gear game. <laughs> make it on the Atari. In fact, that, that's it. That's but, it. Those are the only two about, franchises I'm going to tackle. I'm, I want to do my own original games now, and that's what I'm working on right now, yeah. actually. Uh, that's what I wanted to ask, because... Uh, Mostly, if you are some kind of cover, people recognize it, but uh, your own stuff are mostly yeah. off the light. Uh, and that's what I really hated, and uh, that's why I want to ask uh, you about your own games, yeah, I, your, I've your own ideas. Yeah, I've had my own ideas for games since I first started learning programming when I was a kid. Um, and I did make a lot of my own games. Um, but now, here, here's the uh, making games for the Atari now, and I got those two out of the way. And then after I got those two out of the way and I got some recognition for it, now I feel, because I've got some recognition, that I could put out my own game. And since now I have Princess Rescue and Zippy the Porcupine under my belt, that people will think that, oh, this next game he's working on is probably going to be just as good. And they expect like a certain amount of quality from myself. And um, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to outdo myself on this one, just like, like I did with the previous two games. In fact, on this one, I'm using a... What's called DPC Plus, which is a, an additional chip that's in the cartridge, uh, an ARM chip, um, that DPC takes care of a lot of stuff. DPC, the one that were used in Pitfall. Oh, sorry, was that? That was the. That was the. Yes, it was the, chip used the in original Pitfall DPC 2. chip. Is what uh, is in Pitfall 2, which allowed for not just the. Um, it was mainly known for the uh, sound that it produced. Uh, yes, but yeah, it does have other features as well, which is why you got so much detail in a lot of stuff. Yeah. The large levels that are in that game. Oh, and by the way, I did see your review of that. The vertical, oh, yeah. the vertical yeah. scrolling on the screen. Yeah. And that was mm -hmm. very great in that game. But uh, somehow uh, there were things that were left out uh, in Pitfall 2 that was uh, in Pitfall the first. Uh, were there things that <laughs> uh, were left out from um, Sleepy. Yes. Ideas that were wasted because oh, uh, there was nothing enough stuff. I, I knew what the limitations were going in because I learned them all from Princess Rescue, my experience with that. So going into this, it's like, okay, so what can I do and what can't I do? And if I can't do this, well, what other thing can I do to kind of uh, supplement uh, what I can't? And so that's why there's like the, the bonus stages that you see inside every level. Is that was my uh, that was my solution to get around some of the stuff I couldn't put in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, bound, the like bouncing ones. You, yeah. you mentioned the and bouncing. So there's that. There's another thing I wanted to do that's that I great. couldn't, that's which was having the rings explode from Sonic. You know when he gets hit, couldn't do that. I tried at one point, and it just took up too much uh, program space, and it took up t yeah, it just it just mainly took up too much program space because you had to in order to get that many rings to come out, I had to like individually draw them like frame by frame to do something like that and that just takes up a lot of space that you're yeah, yeah, yeah. so i couldn't do that like i wanted to um so that's why when you run into a, an enemy in, in zippy the porcupine he just invisibly steals the rings from you and in order for you to get them back you have to pop yeah, the enemy yeah. and then he'll give you six of them back <laughs> okay for the last topic I have chosen, uh, what do you think, uh, what would be the best for the Atari brand? Because uh, nowadays they are just doing uh, flashback consoles and uh, other yeah. mostly laughable things and uh, there are some uh, ideas on Kickstarter but uh, I think many of them are just don't have the feeling of Atari. It's like a modern console that uh, tries to seem like uh, an old one, but it's really not that what uh, I would choose for another Atari console. Yeah, I would like to see a flashback unit that has a cartridge port on it, for example. That'd yeah, be yeah Anytime... that's really yeah. missing. Like, you've seen that with... Um, Flashback two could be modded for a cartridge port because yeah, it was... in fact I've done it. I've done it before. Yeah, so I've actually modded a Flashback two to use a cartridge, and it works with most games. Not every game, but with most games, it does actually work. How it does not work with Princess Rescue though. I've tried it. It will not work with that. 
I plug Pr Pr Princess Rescue in with my modified uh, flashback too, and Mario shows up on screen, and it does some funky stuff, and it, that's all it does. It won't run uh, Princess it, Rescue because it, it, it probably it opens a secret doesn't know how to access the that you don't know about. <laughs> so yeah, what I'd like to see for the Atari, um, yeah, I would like to see it have a comeback. It'd be nice. Um, uh, of course, it's no longer the original by the same Atari. People, yeah, it used to be. It's been passed around. It's basically just a name now. It's yeah, really yeah. Name. So it's just people I just could say it's alone name in the dark for whatever yeah, purpose yeah. they want. <laughs> so that's why you don't see anything really serious for it come out besides maybe Atari flashbacks or maybe game compilations for consoles. And uh, how many people you know who have beat ZP? <laughs> um, they have actually gotten all five gems. Uh, nobody except me. Uh, <laughs> I beat it, but nobody... uh, it was freaking hard, and I was shouting. Oh, you like got all five hell. gems! <laughs> you got, you did get all five. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could have to do it. Yeah, it's rupees not or easy. I didn't want or to what are they? But the last boss when the. Uh, the stars were <laughs> falling down <laughs> in that specific. Oh, the stones! Yeah, that's the that, uh, that when you're in cave zone. Freaking yeah. me! Oh, this was really hard to expect where, where it. The will last, come yeah, from. the last battle is different. Yeah, the, when you're doing the fifth gem, it goes into a special uh, boss yes, battle. Yes, the final he does boss. This disappearing <laughs> trick, and you have to figure out which one he is, and then attack that one. Yeah, I did that one special because I wanted the last gem you get to be its own boss fight. Yes, so I did that one special. It was a good idea. And there is a special ending too. Uh, there's a, kind of a secret special ending that only happens if you get all five gems and you beat all sixteen levels. Oh no, I have all that. I have no power. For <laughs> you it do all that, <laughs> left because... and you will get a special ending. But I don't know if anybody has done it. And I will tell you that I don't even know if it works. <laughs> in emulation, it works in emulation. But I was never able to test on the real thing because I didn't have the patience to try to do all that. Me too, on because the real machine. <laughs> I have already so, argued with my girlfriend great, because of it. Because sorry. I was sitting here <laughs> playing the game, and uh, he asked for a free day for that one for Monday, and I was sitting here playing the game. <laughs> she was very nervous, so <laughs> I have no patience for that <laughs> either. <laughs> But it was great to yeah, see it, the congratulations uh, on the screen. Oh yeah, that's the normal ending. Yeah, when yeah. you get five gems. But yeah, if you get okay, I don't know if I want to spoil the surprise or not uh, with the the fine the good ending, I guess you can call it. Um, but maybe I will because I don't know if anybody will ever get see it. But to be brief, it's basically the same thing as a regular ending. But you get an, another menu option that allows you to play all the songs in the game. Oh! Menu. And you can just play them at any time. That's a classic. So that, that's, that's, like that's, that's your gift. extra. <laughs> yeah, that's your prize for yeah, the yeah. entire game and all the levels. Yeah. That was that included in many of the odd games. Music. Yeah. Like, yeah, and that's like all, I wanted to do more than that, but that's all I could fit in. Okay, I was at of, the of very course. limit of my space, and it's like, okay, I want a special ending, but. I can't do much. What can I do? Well, I can make it so it plays all the songs that you can through a it's menu. It's like in many games when uh, uh, you beat the game with uh, all the secrets found, and you get an option to play all the cinematics again. <laughs> it's like that. A bit. Oh yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's a similar kind of thing. And even with like Princess Rescue, I decided to do what the original Super Mario Brothers did. When you beat it, you can go back, do a second quest, and it's harder. And so I did that with Princess Rescue, and it didn't take much more code to do that because it's just a matter of altering certain variables yeah. if something is a certain, you know, if, if it finds out, oh, you beat this? Okay, we're going to just change these things here and there, and then now you got That's the points. classical, oh, you have not suffered enough, you, you can have more. <laughs> yeah, lots of fun. It's like in Zelda. <laughs> That had it as well. Oh yeah, that's right. There's a second quest in Zelda too. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when I was a kid and I played that and I, I beat that as well. I beat the first and second quest on that. So this is for today's interview. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> what a wrap up. <laughs> Have a good time. No? What a wrap up the interview. Okay. Bye. See ya. Okay, yeah, yeah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is for today's interview. Bye, have a good time.
Nos, ma is rengeteget tanultunk, legfőképpen azt, hogy egy konzolnak igenis lehet nagyon komoly utóélete. Most viszont, ahogyan ígértem, fejezzük be a játékokat, és következzék a várva vár... Mi a fene? Megállj! Adom vissza! Na várj! Ez a The Last Ninja zenéje! Ha, 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 kitalálom! Legközelebb be kell mutatom! Mi a tökömet keres egy golfütő egy ninjánál?